So hi everyone uh, and welcome to Cadurance Meetups. Uh, my name is Lucy. I'm a UX researcher uh, at Cadurance in Barcelona uh, and I will be the host for this evening. Uh, just to, a little bit of background about us at Cadurance. Uh, Cadurance is a global consulting company uh, that was born out of the software craftsmanship community. Uh, our goal is to enable organizations to drive innovation through agile software practices hands-on expertise and special, specialist expertise and expert advice. Uh, presenting our talk is Mac, uh, who is a software craftsperson at Cadurance as well. He comes from a scientific background with formal qualifications in psychology and computer science. Uh, and in today's talk, we're gonna be doing the last in uh, a series of three, um, and it's gonna be on soft skills in software development, which is super interesting topic. Okay, so five past now, I think we'll, we'll get started. So what I'll do is I'll just pass you over to Mac, who will take it away. Cheers, Lucy. Uh, right, good to see you all today. And this is the third and very final, finally, uh, meetup on the soft skills in general. So today, uh, we'll just go with considering how many people we have and considering that we are doing this online, remotely, etc. We're just going to do it in a slightly more conversational way. So today, I'm not going to do any any sort of slides, any screen sharing, I'll just talk. If you have any questions, just post them and we sort of like, we can do sort of back and forth. Uh, if you if you feel like it, feel free to enable your camera. I mean, we, we, we in, in the current day of time, we sort of see not enough people as it is. And that, that's why, so the reason why I'm not sort of hiding behind another screen of presentation. So we can actually try and get at least some sort of face context and at least a sense of human interaction. So today, basically, we primarily, I would like to speak about two things, and one of them is the attention uh, and, and, and just a very brief introduction. So an idea why, why it is important to think and speak about attention in the current time, because it is. And also some sort of foundation, like what it is, where to look for more information. Also, as I go on today through, through certain things, I will send you some links to some resources when you can do more in-depth reading. Uh, so, and yes, and also in terms of attention, I would like to just quickly outline the methods that you can sort of try and do to maintain a better attention on, on during your work and during the meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So I try to focus it also on the, on the premise that we are all sort of software developers and there are a few practices that are quite specific to us. And then in the, in the sort of final, well, almost final section, I will quickly outline a research design. Uh, so again, I'm not going to go much in depth, more in breadth, and I'm going to also focus primarily on the qualitative research. Uh, and I'll outline why as well, and why is it sort of more relevant for us as it is, as opposed to, for example, quantitative, well, quantitative research, for example. And as a final note, uh, I will just quickly summarize what we covered in the whole section of all three meetups and if you have any questions on them uh, we can address it at this point so we started the whole series on the premise that basically software development is is it is a social technical practice so if we look at basically what is the splits statistically between the tasks that are related to all our technical skills and our sort of soft skills let's call it uh, we sort of draw a conclusion that, you know, at least half of it and half of our attention is focusing on the sort of like non-technical or the soft skills. So that was the premise of the whole sort of series that we've done. And in the previous one, we basically, we outlined this. We talked about the soft skills and what is the issue with the time itself, uh, what are its flows, et cetera, et cetera. And we outline a concept uh, introduced by one of the researchers in the United States quite recently called core skills, which is competencies on organization and relational effectiveness, which is a sort of like a substitute, a rebranded version of soft skills. That is quite relevant. And then we went through several topics that are quite specific to the soft skills. We talked about the theory of mind which is basically our ability to read others' emotions, thoughts, et cetera, and basically interact with human beings. Uh, we talked about 
uh, cognitive biases, some of them, and the takeaway message from it was that the cognitive biases, it's helpful to think about them uh, similarly to optical illusions, uh, because similar to them, we, are, we might be aware of them and we might learn how to recognize them in a specific context, but as soon as they happen elsewhere, they are an illusion, so we sort of fall for them anyway. And in this sort of specific scenario, we talked about debiasing the tasks. So as a policymaker or as a someone who is producing some sort of uh, pathway for someone, you can predict certain places where people will be prone to biases. So we outlined a few of them. Uh, in the second one, we talked about personality and personality types. So we sort of outlined the, mainly we focus on the big five theory of personality types. And the takeaway message was there that people are more than introverts and extroverts. We, we have a tendency to flatten people to, oh, he's an extrovert, he's an introvert, that's it. Actually, there are quite a few more spectrums in which it is helpful to think about yourself and about, also about other people to basically make more accurate and more fair judgments towards them. So the other spectrums were apart from extroversion, introversion was openness to experience, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and emotional stability. Uh, so today, like I said, we're going to wrap it up with the, with the attention uh, that is quite relevant to us, and then research method, and that'll be it. So in terms of the attention, uh, wh why, why I decided to sort of talk about it is Basically, right now we live in a, in a situation where you know attention is a commodity that different companies are basically trying to get from us, and we are the only sort of entities that can provide attention to different things. So you know it's 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 similarly in a way as with money. So if you understand how money work, you know you make yourself less likely to be in a situation in which you're poor. Similarly, with attention, the more you understand about attention, the more likely you're able to in a way, predict or manage this resource that you have to basically direct it into the things that are valuable to you, not the others. So basically, we are sort of in this sort of era where we sort of like everything is quite heavily based on the Skinner box psychology, where, you know, you have this sort of like reward and punishment for different things. Uh, so I'm not going to go a lot in depth in here. Uh, but this is the first part where I'll just send you some resources to do more reading about it, because it is quite fascinating subject. So the first one is a sort of an intro that outlines uh, the, it's a, it's a relatively short article, but it outlines what the whole commotion is all about. And the second of all, uh, second link is the book. And this book is written by a guy who previously worked in Google and is an expert on, on this theory and, and sort of knows how it sort of works behind the scenes. So if you are at all interested in it, uh, I would definitely recommend both of them, at least the first link. It's, it's a quick read, it's like five minutes. So you should be able to have enough attention to read it top to bottom. So in terms of the of the definition of what actually the attention is, you know, it's 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 basically ability to to focus on external and well internal as well stimuli, and the internal stimuli is you know your, your thoughts, your fears, etc. External is you know bright flashing lights somewhere, and you know most of the research that has been done actually on on, on attention is is actually focusing on attention in per, in the context of perception. So it's either auditory or visual attention. So they're looking at what sort of stimuli you need to have to basically direct your attention to produce a given action. So there isn't there are paradigms to look at the internal attention as well, but there aren't that much research. So unfortunately there isn't that sort of this in this area. So attention itself also heavily overlaps with things like you know, your consciousness, uh, working memory, your ability to focalize and to select a stimuli that you that you want to attend. Uh, some people basically say it's its ability to possess someone mind to take possession of that mind. And if you think about actually what the attention is, it's sort of, it, it, it works both ways. So at one point you, you use, yes, you are focusing on one thing, but at the second sort of side of it, you withdraw from something else. And that withdrawal allows you to actually deal with something else effectively. So basically it's just a focus on the cost of ignoring something. 
and it's it's also heavily connected with our ability of you know of doing mental effort things and to concentrate uh, around stuff. So so like I said, in terms of science and scientific research and evidence, most of it was done you know looking at you know attention in perception, and from that we get a lot of models. And you know, and also as as part of it, we, we know about you know several phenomena, like for example, change blindness, which is pretty well researched and is quite fun to watch and you know test it on yourself. So you will have stuff like flicker flicker paradigm, where basically you have two very similar images that basically are being shown one after another. And people, what people do, they will just ignore very obvious changes that are between those two flickering images. And what it sort of what it informs us about is how we attend to things, but basically we're more likely to attend to motion of things rather than basically static changes. We also have you know more extreme cases where uh, you have experiments where without noticing it is possible to switch person you're having a conversation with. So there have been numerous uh, presentations and experiments to a degree where you actually go to a reception, you start to speak with the cleric, cleric tells you, oh, I need to, you know, grab some document to go underneath the desk and different person stands up, very rarely people will notice. So this sort of shows to which extent we actually don't notice stuff that should be obvious, but actually isn't there. And it informs us about, you know, certain flaws with, with our attention. So I would definitely say, uh, go ahead and, and look at those experiments. They, they are quite interesting. So if you just look for change bloodness at YouTube, you would definitely find a lot of interesting videos that sort of better show it. Uh, and it's sort of like also overlap with the inattentional blindness. And this sort of is more sort of relevant in sort of like real life scenario when you have an eyewitness testimony. And especially in, you know, like stressful situations where situations that are happening very, very you know, rapidly, people will perceive the same situations very differently. And especially in the context of, you know, eyewitness testimonies, it can have like horrible, horrible effects because people will basically add their own layer of interpretation upon what actually they perceived and they will have a very different recollection of the events. So it's, it's, it's sort of, again, it's, it's further emphasizes this concept that the attention is not that excellent and our ability to, you know, record stuff as it is, is not that excellent. Uh, another sort of area in which attention is quite interesting is, is the human computer interaction. So you have UX designers like Lucy here, uh, she probably know more stuff about it than I do, but it's basically, you know, we have a tendency to, especially with the mission critical system, to do incorrect stuff in the because there is too much data and we are not able to differentiate what is actually relevant. And in extreme situations, you have stuff that happened in Hawaii, I think that was 2018, when there was false missile alert. It was basically because of the poor UI. And again, it all stems down to basically our ability to attend things. Only because something is written somewhere, it doesn't mean that people will perceive it and interact with it correctly. And another thing that sort of we get generally from, 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 from the evidence is the concept of salience. And basically salience is, the, is a quality of an item and for it to stand out in a very specific context. So it allows us to, it allows it to basically to drive your attention towards it. So if you're writing an article, for example, and all of a sudden we have a video on the site I, I bet you it's going to have more higher saliency than the text because it's moving, uh, colors, different things are happening. Same thing happens in a pub. You're in a pub, you're having a conversation with your mate. It's all fine. There is a lot of screen behind him. There is a very good probability you actually start paying attention to the screen behind the person rather than attending the conversation. And in terms of actual models, uh, I don't see a lot of point in going into them the bottom line with most of the points. So we have like broadband model, we have attenuator model, you have Deutsch and Borg, et cetera. So they, they are sort of like classical models that you have. And basically what they describe is what is happening between the input and your reaction. So you have different approaches in which some of them will say, well, actually, you know, you have inputs and you have two things and one thing gets filtered very quickly and the other thing goes straight in. 
the others say, oh yeah, the first thing goes in, but the second thing is sort of like muted a bit. And then if it's relevant, it will get processed. So they all sort of talk about this black box that is you know, used to process the data in between the input and the output, so your action. And uh, if anyone wants to do like in-depth reading of it, I will recommend this particular book. Let me just quickly copy a link. Uh, I particularly enjoy this one because they draw a lot of analogies between human cognition and brain and computation. And it's, it's actually, if, if you look at the history of, 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 you know, of cognitive sciences, uh, historically, the brain and thinking processes will be compared to the most advanced technology of the time. So it's, it's actually funny to see how it sort of goes through, you know, like hydraulic systems on the brain works basically exactly like that. And we usually find the, the sort of highest, most advanced analogy to compare, compare the brain to. And this is exactly what they do across this book as well. So it is a, it is a very good read. And the bottom line sort of from all the models that we have is that there is no one dominant or definite one uh, so there is really no pragmatic point in discussing them. There is point if you really want to sort of like, if you're really, really interested. And what is sort of interesting from, from all of them, it's, is that our attention basically and how deeply we process different things uh, will depend on how much processing power we basically have. And the brain generally is lazy and as much as possible, it will try to minimize stuff. So we'll, it will do whatever it can to process as little as possible. And basically this is how it is. And it will try to automate as much stuff as it is possible. And with the attention, we have three main mechanisms. So one is to engage with something. So to engage your attention and pay attention to it, to disengage from it. And we know from clinical psychology, for example, there are some people who have difficulty in disengaging with different things and also to shift uh, your attention from one thing into another. Uh, and that is, that, is, that is basically the part online with it. And what is interesting, so then another sort of thing that comes in is people talk very often about split attention. And yes, split attention does exist. And basically what is helpful is to think about your split attention with basically you have resource, which is basically your ability to pay attention to stuff. And depending on how many things you do, you will split this resource into other things. And basically the more you split those resources, the more automated, in a way, your interaction with the things that you're attending to will have. And then in this sort of space, you can have, you can think of three axes of the tasks that you're trying to attend. First of all, is the similarity of the tasks. So if you have, for example, programming in PHP and in, for example, in C, uh, they are relatively similar tasks. Then you have the complexity of the tasks. So if the tasks are very complex, then, well, it will be more difficult. And then there is practice in the given tasks. So on those three axes, your sort of worst case scenario is if you try to do two very similar tasks that you are not very comfortable with, and both of them are complex. This is the moment when you start to make a lot of errors and the outcome will be probably quite horrible. Uh, what also we know, but so from the slightly different spectrum, is if you try to pay attention to different things when you're having a conversation with another person, uh, the, the effects probably will be quite horrible. And and first of all, you're not going to be trustworthy, and second of all, the other person will not be interested in continuing the conversation. So if you're checking your phone, if you're doing something else, or if you say, "Oh, I need to just sort of do this," or you look at some something else. Uh, people will not engage with you. They will, they will not have a quality conversation and they will think less of you as well. But that's a whole different sort of story. So, so this is like a very brief and very sort of short story behind, behind the attention. And in terms of the important things, so the pragmatic things that we can do, especially in the programming, I guess there is this sort of going mantra uh, that based on one study done once that, you know, on average, it takes around 10, 15 minutes to sort of regain your attention and focus on the programming once someone interrupts you. 
So if you're sort of in the so-called zone, someone comes in and asks you about something else, it will take you 10 to 15 minutes to get back to the zone. It, it is sort of helpful for other people and that's to know and what you can do about it is, first of all, is to signal to other people when you are sort of in, in the zone and when you are programming. One caveat about this is uh, you can't be always busy. So if you're always busy, people will basically say, well, he's always busy. I need to, you know, I need to have his attention for a while. So if you're going to do this, then have a very specific periods when people know not to disturb you. Then another thing that you can do is, is basically pair programming or right? programming with more than one person. Because then when someone continues to interrupt you or something happens to interrupt you, uh, you have another person to take care of it. Or if you're sort of going off the roots and you're starting to focus on something else, you have another person to help you realign and actually stay focused on the task. So in this respect, it is also very helpful. And it's also a very good argument towards so saying pair programming is actually beneficial because it helps you to maintain this higher focus on the task. You have two people checking each other out. Then in programming, break regularly. So use stuff like Pomodoro or whatever, uh, it, it, it will help. The longer you're focusing, the easier it will be. So the lesser threshold you will have to get sort of distracted with something else. If you keep your focus sessions relatively short, you will have a better quality of the focus. Uh, some people say something about music that sort of helps you to stay focused. I would say not really. Uh, music can be quite erratic. Uh, it can basically, you have different playlists, different stuff. You will basically, your attention will shift back to basically selecting the correct track. Even if you're playing a podcast or something else, it, it will shift your attention to it. So basically change it if you don't like it. Uh, personally, I think white noise is quite good. If you're working in a noisy environment, if you use white noise, basically there is no information in it because it's noise and you can sort of stay focused and muffle out everything else that is in there. Another scenario in which it is difficult for a lot of people to stay focused are meetings. And the first thing, and I, I think it's, it's the most helpful one, before you attend a meeting, set your goals for the meeting. So state just for yourself what are you hoping to get from that meeting what are why are you there and try to achieve that uh second of all pay attention so sort of gamify it so pay attention who is speaking what are the connections which people are you know most likely to speak to each other what is the tone of those people when they speak to each other how the tone shifts when they basically start speaking to another person what sort of what things sort of trigger them and sort of pay attention to those things. It, it will be quite uh, interesting. Then, you know, obviously, you know, disable stuff that basically distracts you. So if you have a meeting where people are looking at the phones, it's pointless. Everyone is wasting time. There, there, there is no need for that. Uh, what is also very helpful is to take notes. And what do you notice know? basically what is being said? What is the meaning of these conversations? What are the keywords that are being used? And also what I find personally quite useful is I, I know the point at which I got bored. Because at some points, like if you have a long beat, you will get bored. Just note down what bored you. And if you basically get bored, I would say either excuse yourself because there is no point to basically sit in a meeting where you're just not paying attention and just go elsewhere for a moment and come back. Uh, just say you have a call or whatever you need to go to. It doesn't matter. Just excuse yourself, come back after a while and then you'll be actually able to pay attention or just ask to pause the whole meeting and restart because the chances are if you are getting bored and you are more or less on the same level of interaction than other people there are the key speakers there most likely other people are bored at this point as well and not paying attention as well so i think everyone at this point will benefit and as a sort of caveat to all of that in the meetings uh is to avoid judgment of the speakers if you judge a speaker very early and you say, well, he's talking, you know, not very logically, or he's not a very good speaker, or I disagree with him, or, or you start to judge him in any way, it will be very difficult to pay attention to that person. So you're just doing yourself a disfavor by basically doing that. And also when you sort of sort of start to lose your attention is very often to engage, so ask for clarification, or can you ask them to repeat it? And in, or in any way, basically make yourself heard. And then when you start to feel that you're part of the whole exchange in the meeting, it will be easier for you to pay attention because there is a stake for it now, all of a sudden. Uh, another thing, 
uh, in the context of you know mostly reading and learning is do one thing at a time. It helps when you read, read. When you basically look for resources, look for resources. Separate those two activities. What very often happens, and what I notice with among many other thing, people, is especially if you if you do it on a computer. You start to read, you find either a link or something, you click it, you go, you miss, you lose your focus altogether because you start to jump between different things. You have no idea what is going on. If you're working on something, find your resources first, read them. If something is unclear, make a note of it, return to it later. Make small goals as well as you do it. So if you're working on a larger piece, just make what question I am trying to answer by reading this piece of text or watching a video or what's not. It will help you. If you have a clarified goal, you will be able to achieve that goal. Okay, break it and then return to it in, in, in a moment. What I also tend to do, but it's a personal preference, so I will not advertise it that heavily. If I have to do something that is sort of very important to do and I really need to read it, and I know there is a lot of distraction and I do it on the computer, I would literally throttle my internet connection. I'll use the depth tools. I will throttle it down as much as possible. And what happens is if you don't get the sort of like instant gratification of opening your page and getting some sort of insight into it, it no longer is that sort of interesting or you know attractive to do. And all of a sudden you'll be actually able to 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 basically focus on the thing that you were actually trying to do rather than jumping between different things. Uh, and generally speaking, I was going to say, okay, I'm going to cover it a bit. One thing that we also tend to do is not really rest lately, especially in the in these sort of like weird times when most of us are heavily working from home and have very limited access to stuff. And a lot of people actually mentioned it. So it's it's a wider subject where it's, it's hard to draw this line between work and and not working. And it's 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 also getting the quality rest. Uh, the thing is, very often with us, I mean, I'm not talking only about that. Is 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 our consumption of media is very weird these days. So in an hour of our normal time, we are able to consume basically two to three hours of media because we play a tally in the background. We might play a podcast and try to read something at the same time. And this is not it, it's it's something that people generally do. So we consume more than we actually can. We also have constant distractions from different notifications and stuff like that. And we find it difficult to actually focus on a single thing, like even having a meal. And I know it's been a case for, for a lot of people, but it sort of all boils down to you know, practices similar to mindfulness, for example. So I would say it's, it's, we sort of live in this sort of like almost like a Skinner box experiment, uh, but it's not mandatory. So we, we still have sort of control of it. So we, we can disable notifications. We can sort of like focus on one thing and do one thing only and actually enjoy it and be fine with it. Like we're not going to miss anything out. So in general, uh, I would say it's valuable to pay attention to attention. And to do that, it's, it's helpful to measure it as well. And if, if you can manage something rather than managing time, try to manage your attention and your focus because you, you get a better return on it. It's, it's worthless to spend eight hours or something while you can focus on it and do it in three or four, for example. So what is valuable for a lot of people is to check at what points of the day you have the best ability to focus because it will vary. It's not something that you have universally distributed across the whole day. You have this attention and sort of bam, jump in straight there and you can just do it. Monitor that at what points of the day you were able to focus better. Also, it will vary across the week. So towards Friday, you'll probably be less able to attend because you generally are being tired and it's perfectly normal and okay. Uh, and also what really helps is, is to note the distractions and the structures in general. So for me, it's Slack very often. Someone will just ping me and it's it breaks the whole flow. I disable Slack these days because then I enable it once an hour just to check if there are no notification. Same with emails, et cetera, et cetera. And it generally helps you because all of a sudden you can get yourself in the state where it's actually quite pleasurable when you're actually in a zone and are able to focus on something, that is it's actually pretty good. And you know, also pay attention to your sort of like internal thoughts and feelings. 
you know, if, if, if you if you have something, because that's also can be a destructor and very strong destructor, especially if you're quite stressed, it's better to deal with the stressor first and then try to focus on something. It's it's difficult to do something like that. Uh, was this helpful actually when you when you notice your destructors is to also rank it how valuable was actually to attend the destructor so you can basically give it like even a numeric value between one and five for example when one is completely useless and five it was like life-saving and most often when you get a notification or something like that, it was just garbage. It was nothing. It was not relevant at all and brought no value to your life, but you sort of are almost conditioned right now to respond to different notification. And this will also prove to you that there is no reason to attend all those weird stuff around you. So yeah, that's basically it. And on the final notes on this one, uh, it's fine to be bored. And there, there is nothing wrong with being bored and there is no reason why you're bored, just be bored. It's okay, that's, that's perfectly cool. Uh, sometimes you just have to be bored, but it's not the reason to sort of seek this sort of instant gratification by you know attending to some you know different stuff online rather than checking your Instagrams or whatever, just to sort of get some sort of stimulation very quickly and very quick reward. It will have a detrimental effect on your attention over time. So just sometimes just accept you're bored and that's fine and maybe find something valuable over time to do. There's no need to be constantly stimulated. It's a sort of another addiction. And yeah, basically focusing is hard. <laughs> and, and there is nothing we can do about it. This is how we are basically wired. So jumping from this to a slightly more or less, less personal subject is, is the research methods. And why I wanted to cover it as this like very, very final thing in the whole series is because basically, oh, so two reasons. First of all, what we do is sort of informal experiments all the time, whether we like it or not, this is how we wire. We have our assumptions, then from our assumptions, it sort of shape how we do our actions, then we observe what was the outcome of it, and then we draw conclusions. So we do it sort of like all the time, whether we like it or not. And basically we draw our conclusions based on our intuition or perception. And usually they are like quite flawed or biased. So they're not the best source of knowledge to inform our sort of future actions. Also, it sort of stems from the fact that this, especially in, if you, in the workplace environment, it is very helpful to say why you reached a given conclusion on a given thing. And if you, if you have more systematic methods of gathering this data and, and, and processing it, you can actually improve your logic and improve the reasoning behind the things that you actually do. So when you do, when you say, for example, we should basically move to microservices or whatever, or do, do any sort of decision, you can sort of say, okay, I've done it on this project and this situation, and this is what we've done. And you can sort of present evidence basically of the things that you've done in the past. And you can also reason why it might basically transfer to something else. And second reason why it's, it's noteworthy is we rely too much on our memory. And as we know, human memory is very prone to corruption in a way. So, I mean, memory, human memory is, is the, we will live by it. So it, it is good enough, but in, in, in this sort of like modern society and the modern context where things are extremely complicated, that they, they aren't that good. And, and some in, in interesting things we can, we, we know about the memory is, first of all, there, there are things called implanted memories. Uh, it's not a movie thing. It's a thing that you can actually do. And uh, quite a few quite scary case studies where implanted memories were actually were planted on people uh, without any, you know, they, 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 were, they were not done on purpose, but they just sort of happened. And then this was that, or well, actually, we were responsible for it. Uh, also, as we store our memories, they get sort of reinterpreted. So we get some sort of version of the events. And also those stored memories get distorted quite heavily. So depending on your age, they will, they will change. And what you often see is, well, especially if you speak to adults and the older adults, the better results you get, you will see a very glorified version of their youth. 
And this is not how it happened most of the times. But over time, this is a natural process. We all go through it. It's perfectly fine. But it, it is just going to happen. And on the final note, uh, like as discussed basically earlier, we have quite a few biases that we have to keep in mind. So one of them is hindsight. So basically, when we attempt a situation in this very, very sort of naive and natural way, we will perceive it like this was obvious, like this happened because it, it had to happen. We sort of, I don't know how we didn't know about it. When you have a sort of like trail of documentation, when you sort of like noted how things happened, you, you are basically less likely to commit that. And also you're less likely to commit this sort of like common sense issues. So when we talk about the research, we, we sort of have th those two sort of main branches where we have the qualitative and the quantitative research. We also have like mixed methods that are basically this and that together you know, different configurations. Uh, in terms of the workplace, I think that uh, generally like in, in casual life, let's say, the, I think the most uh, valuable approach is actually qualitative uh, because we, we usually work on a very small samples of people. So it's usually people that are around our team or maybe in a small organization. So this is our scope in which we can sort of reliably look at. That's why I'm just going to focus on it on a slightly better. And also quantitative research involves talking about statistics and statistical analysis. And that's basically two semesters on the university or <laughs> quite a few good, good courses online. So uh, I, I just don't want to basically go into talking about, you know, ANOVAS, MANCOVAS and, you know, chi-squares and all of that, uh, because there is no space for that right now. Uh, I would recommend uh, some books. I will send it later actually to look at uh, because sometimes you might find yourself in a situation where, where it is actually relevant to, to use those methods. But most likely than not, if you're using those methods, you will find a very particular statistical test that you are using for your very specific uh, study design. So again, there, there is no reason to cover it in breadth because most likely you would find something that is very particular because you're comparing two groups on this particular variable and you have this and this sort of type of data and it's distributed like that. So you, you will need to find your own sort of tools to analyze and draw inferences from that data uh, as you actually do it. So just to sort of clarify, by, by quantitative research, I mean about you know, dealing with numbers and statistics and qualitative is basically more about words and meanings in a way. So quantitative allows you to sort of test your hypothesis by basically collecting and analyzing data. And qualitative is basically allows you to explore uh, ideas or phenomena more in sort of depth to gain some more understanding. So um, how you basically approach any sort of endeavor to do any sort of research is uh, you start with a, so especially in the, in the qualitative research, you start with a single sort of concept, idea or phenomenon that you want to look at. Uh, you think about who your participants are. So who are the people involved in the study? What is the setting of it? What is the context of it? But most importantly, you create your operational definition. So if you, for example, want to look at the concept called communication, let's say, in the context of your team, you will at this point specify what do you mean by communication or effective communication. So is it the ability to between to, to communicate ideas between the team members? Is this the idea to do something different altogether? You will build this definition here and there and it needs to be explicit and it needs to be quite precise. Uh, if you were to do a quantitative research, uh, you would usually start with some sort of model or a framework that you're trying to evaluate. You will then identify it with sort of variables you're using. So you have your independent variables that you sort of like control. So this could be like a caffeine, for example. And then you have your dependent variables, which is the stuff that you're measuring. So it could be speed of typing. So you can have basically study that measures the impact of caffeine on the speed of typing for your developers. But what would be the point of it? I have no idea. And then basically you make your predictions. So you show how they both sort of relate. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and then you basically process the whole whole data as they sort of go. You start to draw your hypothesis. 
you would again have different approaches to forming a hypothesis. So you could have directional or non-directional hypothesis to pose a questions, which could be to describe a thing, how it is, or you could have a question which is inferential. So basically relationship between different stuff. In a qualitative methods that I'm sort of more interested in is you primarily work with text. Uh, and, and that's that's the fact of it. Whether it's transcripts, whether they, it's it's a recording, whether it's a document. If you know how to use machine learning, then he, yes, you, you, you could use uh, quite a few really cool tools to do cool stuff with it. But fundamentally, you will work with that, and you will work in a natural setting. So that's that's again a very big advantage of this approach. You work basically. You you can do the study where you work, because. This is the appropriate stuff for it. And I think that the main, the main sort of benefit of it is you learn from the participants. So you have this sort of like emergent approach where or your theory sort of forms as you gather more and more data. And also what is quite relevant in this is, is your role as a researcher because you are not neutral observer out there. Who you are, what your approach is, the, the types of the conversations that you have with people and how you gather those, it will impact it. Also your knowledge about stuff, it will bias how you process it. So you have to be quite aware of it as well. So your, your data collection could be on many different sort of layers. So you can do observations, you can do field notes, you can do interviews, both structured and unstructured. You can have, you know, like quality documents, which could be like minutes, notes, reports, for example. And once you basically have that and gather that, you can process it and you can process it through many different ways. Uh, one of the sort of like regular approaches is to start with the window win, winnowing, which are basically you reduce your nose to a bare minimum. And you disregard a lot of stuff, you aggregate, you create your themes. And usually for a given study, you usually find around five to seven themes that's sort of like useful. And then basically you, you start to analyze it which basically usually your, your process of data analysis goes like you get all your data that you have at this point, you read it once just to sort of gather your main sort of idea about what stuff else is, and then you start to code this. And generally the codes that you create fall into three categories, which is expected codes, uh, which for example, could be like problems of communication in some sense, some unexpected codes, uh, for example, hunger, like if you're doing study at work, for example, that you're focusing on sort of like communication between the team members, one of the category could be hunger. And then you can find out that, well, all of a sudden people are talking about being hungry all the time and there are no breaks, stuff like that. And then unusual stuff. And unusual stuff is something I cannot think right now because this is unusual. Uh, and usually how we process it, you would, on an example, on an interview, you would take your interview, you would read it once, you would think about it and then you would go through it again and start to identify your themes and categories. Once you've done that, you will take your second interview, you again read it and you try to fit different things into the categories that you discovered. Then you basically look back at it and you realign the categories so that both of them sort of make sense. Then you take the third one and then basically you repeat the whole sort of process for you guys. So you go and on and on and on and on and on until you basically get as little categories as you can. So again, between three and seven, oof, five and seven, and until the point where they reliably fit each other. And when we're talking about reliability is, is three things to sort of pay attention to is validity, reliability, and generalizability. So validity basically is trans trustworthiness and sort of like authenticity and credibility. So you basically achieve it by describing findings explicitly. And he also reflects on, on your bias that you bring to the study and on, on the general other biases that are out there. And you also reflect on the, on the evidence, uh, both from your own study and other sources that sort of contradicts your findings. And that is actually quite important, basically, because we, we have a tendency to only confirm our assumptions. And if you sort of miss this step where you sort of you, you make an argument with your own sort of results, it's, it, it can further uh, move that bias. And 
in terms of generalizability is is how to make those findings that you have found once be more generally applied to other things with the quality of research uh, I would say this is not as applicable as you might wish I mean, you have some situations in which it, this is perfectly right, but most often than not, the research or any study that you're doing, it will be very specific for a very specific context on a very specific company, very specific team, et cetera, et cetera. But it helps you to basically, in this context, further inform your actions and do things slightly uh, better each time as you do it. And I think that's it. And in terms of how you can structure it as well, I think it's worth, worth the mentions. How you design your study, you can design it as a, for example, a case study that probably most of you sort of heard about. And it's, it's case studies, especially helpful if you're doing stuff. If you're investigating situations that are complex or rare, and they can have a lot of value, especially if you're trying to review what caused, for example, a project failure, very very useful you can bring you can build design your study as a narrative so basically you build a narrative from the point of view of people who are there so again it allows you to tell a story of a given thing and understand it better and this one is particularly helpful if you try to transfer knowledge uh, across the organization and build this sort of shared understanding and I think that would be primarily it. I'm just trying to find those two resources that I mentioned about the statistics. Okay, there we go. So if you are so interested in, to, in statistics and stuff like, that, stuff like that, I would recommend those two books. Uh, they are good references. And especially the second one. It's a very, very short book. It's around less than 100 pages. But especially the second one, it's, it helps you to figure out what sort of statistics can you do based on your design of the study. So this is for the quantitative uh, statistics, not the qualitative primarily. And especially the second one, it is quite helpful to sort of start with is then sort of you can build from that and the second one is 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 more of a actually practical reference so when you know what you're doing so you decided to do mancova for example they will tell you based on the on based on the data that you have how can you apply the statistics what sort of transformation on the data do etc 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 so i would say this is a good start if you're looking into statistics and if you're looking generally into the research design as a sort of uh, primer uh, I would recommend that one. Uh, again, not a very long book, but gives you a very nice and brief outline that I think is quite easy for most of the people to relatively easily understand. And in terms of the, like, to sort of wrap it up, why research design in any way? Uh, I mean, obviously today we, we've not done it like the correct way. So this is not this, this sort of like, your typical sort of scientific approach, but it is a bare minimum that for us is practical because in, in, in a work environment, you have a lot of constraints, primarily time, budget, and resources that you have. So you'll not be able to like full scale research on the organization because there's like, no one is gonna approve this ever. But with the very basic tools, you can primarily basically shift your mindsets that you can basically have better documentation and better attention to actually what is happening and document it better. And also to share that documentation with other people so they can also understand things better how they look from different perspectives. So you basically create this layer that allows people to see actually what is happening and it will be valuable and it will come at low cost to you. Because by the end of the day, all you have to do is at different times take notes or record things that have happened and then combine it together and share it with other people. And this will bring value. And we already have different places where we basically can get this data from people. We have daily standups, we have retrospectives, we have other sort of meetings. And it's not that difficult to schedule an interview or something like that with a colleague to basically get more insight into different things and then just document it. So that, that shouldn't be, we have the structures in place to basically do that and it will improve the value uh, that we bring into the company. 
And since I started with the summary, so to speak, I'm not going to close with the summary again. And I think looking by the time we are going to wrap it up at this point. Oh, cool. thanks, Mac. That was a great talk. Super interesting. <laughs>